particles can have wave-like properties. If the momentum is small enough, a moving particle displays the properties of a wave. We can actually demonstrate it. We can take moving electrons, put them through a grating of crystal lattice, and see interference patterns of those electrons behaving like waves. Now, if you have a wave-like property and you put boundaries on it, you have to be here in space and here in space, then you also get the natural ar arising of quantized energy levels. So electrons that behave like waves plus boundaries gives you quantization. Now we need to look at that in an interesting situation. We've looked at a particle in a one-dimensional box. What about an atom? An atom is an electron bound by the nucleus. An electric charge holds the electron about the nucleus. So that's a particle that behaves like a wave plus boundaries on where it has to be in space, that should lead to quantized energy levels for the electron. So let's look at that carefully. First, we'll have to describe three-dimensional space in terms of easy parameters for quantum mechanical calculations. We'll do that using something called spherical polar coordinates. So we'll take the x, y, z dimensions of space, and rather than write our wave functions in terms of x, y, and z, we'll write them in terms of r, theta, and phi the spherical polar coordinates. The wave function we arrive at will be squared to find the probability of where it's most likely to find electrons. So we'll get regions of space, just like in the particle in a box, where the particle is more likely to be located. So let's look at these spherical polar coordinates. How do we describe where an electron is about an atom? Well, it's somewhere about the nucleus in three-dimensional space. We'll draw a vector from the center of the coordinate system, which is where the nucleus will be, out to the electron. And it'll have length r. That'll be our first coordinate, the length r. Then we'll take the angle from the positive z-axis out to that vector r. That will be the angle theta. That's our second coordinate. And then we'll take a third coordinate, the angle of the projection into the xy plane of the vector, and that'll be our third coordinate, phi. So r, theta, phi, three coordinates for three dimensions of space. When we take three coordinates and we, we break up three dimensions of space, we'll get three quantum numbers. Remember when we had a particle in one dimensional space, particle in a box, we got one quantum number, n, that described the energy levels. For three dimensions, we'll get three quantum numbers, one for each dimension. So those quantum numbers will be n, l, and m sub l. Let's look at those quantum numbers and how they relate to the properties of the wave function. So we'll look at the quantum number values and the orbital property. Now, I'm going to start to use the term orbital. What I mean is wave function, or square of the wave function. The orbital is the region in space where the electron can exist. So that's what the wave function describes. I'll use those two terms interchangeably. So Quantum number, first the principal quantum number, n, just like in a particle in a box, has values 1, 2, 3, and describes the overall energy of the system. And just like in the particle in a box, when you have the total number of nodes, n minus 1, you know how high your energy is. More nodes, more energy, now, or higher energy system. Now remember node, that's an area where the wave function goes to 0. The square of the wave function is 0. So it's a region of space where there's no probability of finding an electron. Second quantum number, L, the angular momentum quantum number, has values that depend on n. So the larger n, the more values of n you, L you have. So L starts at 0. Now it's our first 0 value quantum number. And it counts up in integers up to n minus 1. So if n is 3, L could be 0, 1, or 2. That's n minus 1. Now for L, we'll also use letter designations. Now, I know sometimes in chemistry you're thinking, you're throwing this nomenclature at me just to make it confusing. And uh, unfortunately for the S, P, and D designations, I, I don't have a good answer for you. They're historical designations of these values of L, and you just have to memorize them. It, it is kind of a, almost a confusion factor that we're going to throw in on top of this. Sometimes the quantum numbers will be a number, and sometimes it's going to be a letter. <laughs> so memorize these values for L. L tells you the overall shape of the orbital, the shape of the wave function. 
Is it dumbbell shaped? Is it spherical shape? Is it elongated? Is it narrow? Those kind of things come from L. Now, M sub L, the magnetic quantum number, is the third quantum number, and that's going to tell us something about the orientation of that orbital, and it will have values ranging from minus L to L. So if L is 2, you'll go minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, from minus L to L in integer steps. So there could be many values of M sub L for a given value of L. And it's going to tell you something about the orientation. If I have a dumbbell shaped, maybe I'm along the x-axis, maybe I'm along the z-axis. M sub L will help you determine that. So we're not going to look at the actual values of the wave function, the, the mathematical formulas. What we will look at is the values of the quantum numbers. Each set of quantum numbers describes an individual wave function. Just like in a particle in a box, when you took n equal 1, that was a single hump wave function. When you take n equal 1, l equals 0, m sub l equals 0, three quantum numbers, that set describes a single wave function or a single orbital about the atom. We're going to learn how those orbitals relate to the various wave function quantum numbers so that if I give you a set of quantum numbers, you'll be able to tell me the orientation and shape of that orbital. So we'll use pictures to describe the orbitals rather than the wave functions themselves. The wave functions themselves are a complex mathematical formula. What we want to think about is how are the electrons actually distributed about the atom. Wave functions and quantum mechanics tell us that with a high, high degree of precision. This is a beautiful method to describe atoms. When you take the hydrogen atom and you do the quantum mechanical calculations, the results that you get are considered more precise than the experiment. We are so faithful in quantum mechanics. We have such faith in the, the fact that quantum mechanics describes nature that we actually take the calculation of the hydrogen atom values as the actual value rather than the experiment. 99.9% .9 of the time, in, if you're doing chemistry, you're doing any kind of science, the experiment tells you what the actual value is because your theory might not be quite right. For quantum mechanics, the theory is so good that we actually take the values of the quantum mechanical calculations and we say, hey, that's as good as you can get. So quantum mechanics, incredibly precise, incredibly accurate, and a beautiful description of the atom.